Educational Ethics resides in Bethel Park with his wife, Barbara. Let's give him a nice big hand, please. Alexander Hughes, who was a military historian, it's perfectly clear that Admiral Halsey had some issues. And they haunted him, not only through most of his professional life, but in the years of his retirement, and even in his death. And so we have to ask the question, from where does a man like Admiral Bull Halsey come? Thank you. Uh, the the first thing we have to talk about is his family. Uh, he was born into a rather interesting family, uh, made up of uh, two curious streams. The first stream came from his mother. Uh, they were a family who, uh, who were, were best characterized as rich, intellectual, and institutional. On his mother's side, the family included college presidents, politicians, government officials, poets, and even one playwright. Conversely, on the Halsey side, uh, we have a, an interesting collection of people who were marginally successful. And of course, what that means is they were people who did most of the grunt work for which they were well compensated. It's interesting that his father was a pastor. Prior to becoming a minister, he had been a lawyer. And there was an unexplained event that happens in that man's life that could have had an impact upon his son's life as he became the father of Bull Halsey. One afternoon, for some unexplained reason, this man fell out of a third-story window and, of course, was killed, which meant that Bull Halsey's dad was raised as an orphan. Um, when it came time for his education, his mother, well-connected, spoke with a man who had been General Grant's Secretary of the Navy. He was able to learn that the allotments granted to the states, two per year, to be appointments to the Naval Academy, had not been used by the state of Louisiana. And so it was that Bill Halsey Sr., the father of the Admiral, made his way to Annapolis as an interloper. And the reasons that Hughes gives for his making that decision are two. Number one, he wanted to get out of the society of New York City. And number two, he had been infected with the awareness that many of his predecessors had been seafaring, hard drinking sailors. And so he went off to Annapolis. 
And there, at best, he was an average student. Uh, he didn't do necessarily extremely well, but he tried hard. And that made him successful. While he was there, he uh, did not distinguish himself academically. But he did distinguish himself in terms of how he related to his peers. As you know, at the Naval Academy, they operate on something called the honor system. Bill Halsey Sr. was a man who practiced the honor system, but with a decided emphasis upon loyalty. He was loyal to his friends, to his colleagues, and to his peers. Upon leaving, uh, uh, Annapolis, he met and married a woman whose name was Ann Brewster. The thing that brought them together was geography. They were both from New Jersey. And as that marriage began, this young man began his career in the United States Navy. It was a changing Navy. It was a Navy that was going from a long and distinguished history of sailing the seas, to becoming a Navy that was characterized by boilers and mechanics and mechanization. Uh, he was no longer a man who was infatuated with the ancestry out of which he came and indeed the stimulus that he had received at Annapolis, namely seafaring men with the wind in their face. Now. He was faced with the responsibility of dealing with boilermakers, engineers, and construction types. As a result of that, Halsey Sr.'s efficiency ratings began to fall. He did not appear to be on an upward slope. In fact, he stagnated at the grade a junior lieutenant for nearly 19 years. During those 19 years, he was sent hither and yon, first to a naval war college in Newport, Rhode Island, and then to some other kinds of credentialing experiences. And finally, at the age of 46, he was given a command that's hard for those of us who have not been a part of that system to understand. It must have been enormously difficult for him to realize that all of his peers were now lieutenant commanders. It had taken him 19 years to achieve that goal. His first command was on a ship known as the Adams. He was the executive officer there. He was in charge, and tragedy struck him. Uh, he began to suffer from insomnia. He began to have emotional stress and anxieties. And as was true of a lot of individuals during this period in our history's culture, alcoholism became his crutch. Duties, responsibilities, seemed to unnerve him, and being made of a commander only contributed to his decline. After a while, it was necessary for him to be taken out of line command, and he was returned to Annapolis, and he was made the skipper of a ship that was called the Des Moines. It was a ship that was used to introduce young recruits to the art of sailing. That led to a command in the Bay of New York, and that simple command of sailing around New York Harbor ultimately led to a necessity for him to be hospitalized. Gastritis, depression, anxiety, all took their toll. Eventually, he was sent to Washington, and at the age of 53, Halsey Sr. 
was asked to retire. What is interesting about all of that for our purposes this afternoon is to note that at the time of his retirement at the age of 53, his son's career was clearly on an upward scale. And yet, Admiral Bull Halsey always spoke of his father as the captain. He embraced many of the attributes of his father, good gear relationships, loyalty, a sense of purpose. In fact, he carried with him a pocket watch that his father had given to him. He carried it throughout his entire naval career, including during the years of the Second World War in the South Pacific. Bull Halsey once said that the saddest day in his life was the day when he realized that someone had stolen that watch from his quarters. And so you can see that this young boy, growing up with a kind of sad dad in the Navy, turned to the Navy itself as his parent. Uh, Hughes writes that really it was the United States Navy that raised William Halsey. The Navy determined where he lived. It determined what schools he attended, and it also saturated him with a sense of naval culture. William Halsey was born in Elizabeth, New Jersey in 1882. He was born while his father was at sea. He was three years of age, three years of age, before he ever saw his father. And of course, due to the tragedies of his dad's career, he never really grew close to him. It was his mother's family, the Brewsters, with a long legacy of affluence and intellectualism that really constituted his nuclear family. More often than not, when father was away at sea, or sometimes in the hospital for an extended period, it was to the Brewster home that the young Halsey was taken. The book explores uh, some of the experiences that Bill Halsey had growing up as a Navy kid. For example, Hughes writes about the experiences that Bill Halsey had while his father had been assigned to Annapolis to that ship to Des Moines. Curiously enough, the exploits of the little boy are worth noting. At the age of 10, in the town of Annapolis, I'm sure you've all been there, it's a very quaint, lovely little town. This kid was arrested for shooting out streetlights with a slingshot. Does it give you any clues? He was also a member of a football team that was known as the Little Potatoes. And the reason for that name was these were all kids who by parental consent were considered to be tough to peel. Um, during that time, uh, he also began to have a love affair with the very nature of the Navy. And while it was that he spent time intermittently back at that Brewster home in New Jersey, being surrounded by affluence and intellectualism, it was the stays at Annapolis that really shaped him. Admiral Woolsey once said that he could never remember a time when he did not know and see blue jackets. And of course, that was the uniform of, uh, of the Navy. Likewise, most of his friends throughout most of his adult life came from the Navy establishment. Uh, he was a man who, uh, as a little boy, realized that the Navy was almost gone. And so when it came time for him to go off to college, his mother, his mother, 
wrote the governor and the attorney general of the state of New Jersey requesting an appointment to the Naval Academy. Once again, the interloper uh, situation developed in that all of the appointments to Annapolis had been taken up for the state of New Jersey. So it was that because of these contacts of affluence, they were able to secure from a Cleveland banker a tentative appointment to the Naval Academy. That meant that this young boy at least had one foot in the door. For some strange reason, as he awaited the appointment to become full, he was sent off to the University of Virginia, where he declared that he would become a doctor. Now, the one thing that's interesting about his declaration is this. Everything else about his college experience denies the validity of that statement. For example, he was once asked to actually leave the chemistry department because he was given to rather devilish pranks. Secondly, he tried out for the football team, and he made it. But he only rose to the level the practice squad. He also was a member of the Delta Psi fraternity there and was ultimately asked to leave. And so his experiences at the University of Virginia were anything but stellar. You suggest that perhaps the reason for that was that in his recesses of his mind there was only one place Annapolis. During that period, our country was going through something of a change. We had emerged out of the 19th century as a colonial power. The control of the oceans and the seas had increased. And as a result, there was a need for a larger navy. Because there was a need for a larger navy, there was also a need for more commanders. And so it was that in 1900, William Halsey, Jr. received his full appointment to the Naval Academy. He was given six months to prepare for the entrance examination. He did that. And he passed that examination with a perfect score. And finally, in July of 1900, William Halsey began what became a career, his first experiences at Annapolis. Like his father before him, he was terribly average. He did reasonably well in things such as math and English and history. But when it came time to the tough issues of engineering and dealing with the issues of emerging mechanization of the Navy, not so much. At the end of his first year, he ranked 42nd out of 75 cadets. He managed to finish 43rd out of 61. His highest levels of proficiency occurred in the following areas. Number one, seamanship. That is to say, his ability to manage a vessel. Secondly, his ability to relate to his peers. He also shared another interesting kind of recognition. He was third out of 70 in his class in terms of acquiring the most numbers of the merits. <laughs> Most of those had to do with tomfoolery, usually being a minute or two late for a meeting, having a messy room, or then again, oftentimes, having a uniform that wasn't particularly starched. None of them were terrible, but they were symptomatic of this rebel man about to enter into an organization predicated on absolute loyalty. Um, upon his completion of his work at Annapolis in 1904, Halsey
Halsey was assigned as a lieutenant junior grade to the battleship Missouri. Perhaps some of you may, may remember having read or learned about the fact that this ship encountered a horrific accident. Um, in April of the year that he was assigned to that vessel, a huge gun on board that ship exploded. And in the process of that explosion, hundreds and hundreds of lives were lost. The carnage was unbelievable. And it was William Halsey and a man whose name was Captain Croyle, who literally crawled into the brokenness of human body and materials and spent days retrieving the dead and the wounded. That happened on Friday the 13th, 1905. Throughout his entire life, April the 13th, which was a Friday, haunted him. Following the Missouri, he was assigned to a ship called the Don Juan that sailed the Dominican waters. It was sort of a uh, lark experience. And while sailing the waters of the Dominican, which had become a kind of recreational area for the affluent families of America, he met a woman whose name was Frances Grady. She would become his wife. She was also the niece of a civil engineer who was highly placed in the Naval Department. He was then assigned to something that was called the Great White Fleet. It was ordered by Theodore Roosevelt, and it was the largest naval enterprise that had ever been launched by this country. It was, a, it was, a, it was an unbelievable demonstration of naval power. It employed some 691 guns in the fleet. It's a lot of guns. It also had something like 14,000 men who were a part of that organization. It was designed to show power. William Halsey served as the executive officer of that fleet. Um, and he became a man whose job it was to deal with the sailors. Sailors had changed. They were now more educated, more sophisticated. And as a result, Halsey was clearly a good choice in that remember his dad in the honor system, but loyal to friendship. And it was on this experience of the Great White Fleet that William Halsey, Jr., developed his reputation as being a sailor's <coughs> officer. Um, the inquiries and the interactions that he had had with Francis Granby continued throughout that cruise. Letters were sent and exchanged, and he carried in his breast pocket a picture of her and so when he returned from that assignment, he was assigned to Charleston, where he was considered to be an up-and-coming officer. This man moved past, moving from a lieutenant junior grade to normally becoming an ensign. Only this time, he went directly to being a commander. And having had some job security and affirmation, in 1909, he and Fran were married. It was to be a marriage of tragedy. Neither that marriage, two children were born. One, Margaret, and then a son, William. And in the uh, events that we'll discuss in a moment, we'll see the tragedy which that marriage was. But now, he was a young lieutenant commander, with a family, responsibilities. And he was assigned to a ship called the Fluser. It 
It sailed off of the coast of New England. It was a kind of decorative uh, exploratory ship. And William Halsey, mindful of his upward mobility, wrote a letter to the Naval Department making it clear that any time any of their officials were in the New England area, he would be delighted to have them aboard his ship. Well, one of the officials that took him up on that was a young man who was the Assistant Secretary of Navy at that time. His name just happened to be Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And the two of them formed a lasting friendship. Also during that period of time, he encountered a man whose name was Captain William Sims. He was a highly ranked, highly respected officer, a line officer. And he had an interesting approach to running what was becoming the fleet organization of the Navy. And this is what Sims's ideas looked like. Number one, he uh, had an understanding of discipline, but it was never harsh and being spirited. He was a man who was not given to making statements so much as he was interested in asking questions. And thirdly, after he asked the questions, he actually listened to the people who responded to them. He was a good commander in that he was able to massage his troops, having them realize that they were a part of the enterprise. It was Sims who requested Halsey to be his executive officer. And together they spent several months training sailors. That meant shooting at dummy targets, which of course William Halsey loved. It meant preparing men to be at sea, which Halsey loved. Above all else, it provided him an opportunity to deal with a new mentality in the Navy. Fleets, multiple vessels, coordinated to a common purpose. At this period of his life, the first evidences of weakness appear. In that, he contracted and became sick with the mumps. I was interested to note that in the state of Washington, you may have read this recently, in the state of Washington right now, there is an increase of mump cases, primarily among adults. And among adults, that is not a simple and easily treated disease. And so it was with William Halsey. It literally knocked him down, and he was unable to get up. And for months, he was haunted by weakness, by malaise, and by a lack of energy. After a while, that malaise and absence of energy degenerated into anxiety and depression. He was given to panic attacks. He wept uncontrollably. He was afraid of being alone. And for nearly three months, William Halsey, this up and coming lieutenant commander, was in a psychiatric hospital in Washington, D.C. Following that hospitalization, he was assigned to Annapolis, put in charge of policing the midshipmen. And while he was there, Britain declared war on Germany. Along with many of his fellow officers, Halsey began to jockey for an opportunity to return to battle. <coughs> and that was facilitated by the fact that the Navy was changing. In a year and a half, once the First World War began, the United States Navy went from 70,000 sailors to over 550,000 sailors. Equipment became more collect, uh, complex, ships larger. And William Halsey was asked for by name by none other than that man Sims, whom he had first encountered. 
And so he was sent off to England to be a part of a destroyer fleet. Initially, it did not go very well. Let me share a couple of problems. Number one, William Halsey, out of a sense of preserving ordinance, refused the command to drop death charges into waters where there were no evidences of enemy ships. You don't do that in the armed services, but he did. Number two, he once backed a ship that he was commanding, he once backed that ship out of the harbor without a first unleashing the tow lines. A bit of a problem. Thirdly, he also was reprimanded for nearly firing on two vessels that belonged to the United States of America because they had failed to carry the proper flag messaging. But increasingly, he matured, and he became an outstanding, an outstanding destroyer commander. Um, the months that he, the months that he was involved in that enterprise, really shaped him. Really gave him his character. And let me let me suggest some of those things to you. Number one, he was respected for his loyalty. You could trust him implicitly. Two, he was a man of leadership in that he did not lead from a desk. He led from the bridge. Number three, he was a man who was absolutely committed to his people. There was nothing he would not do for them. Four. He became very flamboyant. He wore a lot of jewelry. His language was picturesque. And he had a way of charming people. Number five. He was superstitious to a fault. In that he carried with him a four-leaf clover and suggested to those with whom he sailed they do the same. And also during those years, he became terribly frugal. In fact, Hughes says he was downright cheap. There are two events that I find rather interesting. This guy's a lieutenant commander in the United States Navy, and he wrote, once wrote seven letters of protest seeking a reimbursement for a $21 dentist bill. Think about that. He probably had more in postage than the bill was. The second thing that's interesting is this. He once disputed with the Navy Department over a discrepancy in pay. And the amount of the discrepancy was a whopping $1.68. During this time, he was, he was correct with his family. He wasn't passionate. He did what was expected, but little more. Um, and the family and the marriage began to unravel, not in a sense of unfaithfulness or even anger, but more so in a sense of absence. By the time he was 41 years of age, he had only lived half of those years with his family. Another interesting component that Hughes talks about is his religious thinking. As I mentioned earlier, his grandfather had been a preacher. And he had come from a family that had a bent toward religion. Uh, not so much with Halsey. He attended religious services whenever it was absolutely necessary. And usually those services were of an Episcopal nature because he liked to be around people of wealth. 
And he was once asked if he believed in God. And this was his sense. I'm not so sure. Because I do not know for sure that God was ever in the Navy. <laughs> he was a ultimate company man. Almost to a fault. He was apolitical. He only voted in two presidential elections. One for Roosevelt and one for Eisenhower. Because he believed that both of those men understood and supported the military. While he was respectful of his senior officers, he was not deferential to them. The uh, relationship between him and Admiral Nimitz during the Second World War was his influence. However, with his junior officers and his enlisted men, he considered them to be his friends. Um, he was a guy who had an innate ability to relate to the common man. Uh, he was then given a desk job in Washington, D.C., and that lasted for six months. And he requested to be transferred as the naval representative to Berlin, the attaché. And so he and the family were gathered up, and off they went to, uh, to Berlin. It was a good experience. Uh, those, those, you know, living in our living in our time, travel to Europe is not a big deal, is it? Of course not. The more people did not make that trip at some point. Uh, the access of uh, good uh, transportation, etc., has made it very accessible. But at this time, to be in Berlin, in Germany, in Europe, was a wonderful experience. It was haunted by two sadnesses. Number one, while there, his daughter Margaret developed tuberculosis. And that meant that she had to be treated. And it meant that getting treatment often presented enormous difficulties. Um, the second thing that happened was that Fran began to really exhibit deep depression addressed by alcoholism. And so it was that he petitioned to be returned to the States so that his daughter could receive treatment as well as his wife. And when he returned to the States, he discovered that a whole new enterprise in the Naval Department had begun. It was the development of a ship that was known as an aircraft carrier. Uh, Sims, who by that time was a rear admiral in the Navy Department, called Halsey and said, you're our man. Halsey realized that if he was going to deal well with aircraft carriers, he was going to have to know something about pilots. And so he enrolled in pilot training at Pensacola Naval Base in Florida. Uh, he was 52 years of age. He was a man who ranked, out, outranked every other man in his class. The average age of the class in which he enrolled was 27. And yet there he was. Some interesting things about that experience learning to be a pilot. He was the last guy to solo. Now, if you know anything about pilot training, you know that solo is, is the mark where you finally say, okay, I've got control of this airplane, I know the rules, I can fly it safely. He was the last to reach that horizon. Um, he was also a guy who had the distinct the distinct honor of having overturned two aircraft while they were taxiing on the runway. He also was a recipient of a rather distinguished award. It was called the Flying Jackass Award. And it was awarded to the cadet who did the least amount of training that was successful. And yet, at the end of the day, he passed became a Navy pilot. He would never fly, but he would come to understand the men who did. He was assigned to the uh, Saratoga, one of the first aircraft carriers, and uh, from there on, he 
was ultimately assigned to the Pensacola Naval Base to kind of supervise training. And while I was there, his wife totally fell apart. Um, in letters that he wrote to his daughter uh, that are contained in this book, he talks about how difficult it was for him to hide his wife out of embarrassment for her. And eventually he was faced with the reality of what to do. And so with his daughter living in Philadelphia, Halsey made this choice. He instituted, institutionalized his wife. They would never again live together. They would never again share life. For every real intent, the marriage was over. He ultimately was assigned to the Enterprise in 1939, and he built his command upon two overarching concepts. Number one, responsibility. He expected everyone in his command to take responsibility for their actions, and in fact, he did the same. Hughes writes that there was one event where a, 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 a plane was being catapulted off the deck of the carrier. Something went awry. And the aircraft pummeled into the sea. Whenever Nimitz called and asked, who was responsible for that? Admiral Halsey replied, it was me. The second pillar that he used in his command was an extraordinarily liberal attitude toward disciplining his men. He allowed them a pretty wide berth but there were a couple of things on which he would not compromise. One of them was drunkenness. A second of them was dishonesty. And a third was a lapse in character. And fourthly, and perhaps above all else, the telling of a lie. Uh, with his experience with carriers, developments in Europe and Japan, and an enormous concern about the vulnerability of the United States in the South Pacific under the direct, under the direct leadership of a guy by the name of Kimball, who was back in Washington calling all of the tunes. Halsey was given the rank of Admiral, and he was placed in charge of operations in the South Pacific. He would have been at Pearl Harbor, excepting for one of those great ironies of history. Uh, one of the things that his fleet was charged to do was to, to, in a sense, shuttle aircraft from Pearl Harbor to Wake Island. Because, because all of the intel of the day believed the Japanese would strike Wake Island. So it was that on the infamous day of December the 7th, Bill Halsey was ferrying ships that were taking airplanes, ironically, from Pearl Harbor to Wake Island. And thus, he was spared. It was during the early days of the South Pacific Theater that he interacted with, of course, Admiral Nimitz. Uh, Nimitz was a total contrast to Bill Halsey. Halsey was approachable. Nimitz was aloof. Nimitz was an officer's person. Halsey was an officer of the people. Nimitz was a by-the-book guy. Halsey, not so much. So it was that as the issue of the fleet concept began to be more and more operative in the Navy, uh, an interesting guy, his name was Gormley, he was a he was a, uh, how would I put this? He was a consummate company guy. Was put in charge of the entire operation of the South Pacific. And what that meant was, not only the Navy, but the Air Force, as well as ground troops. Um, he was Nimitz's man. However, Kimmel, back in Washington, saw it differently. And he saw it differently during an interesting time in Halsey's life. Throughout the entirety of his adult life, 
he was haunted by a skin condition that was characterized by itching and rash, and it was terribly troubling. He was hospitalized back in Pearl for that condition. Upon being released, as he was returning to the Enterprise, a ship, a small ship, intercepted them with a communication, a communication from Kim. And this is what the communication said. You are now immediately in charge of the entire Third Fleet and its operation in the South Pacific. And with those words, of course, Gormley, the ultimate company man, was put aside. Besides that, he and old Wolsey had been friends. But that was the moment in which Halsey became the ultimate commander. Um, he did a couple of things as a commander that were enormously embarrassing. For example, there are two events that are known as Halsey's Typhoons. Uh, they describe moments in his command whenever he was faced with extraordinary weather, typhoon weather. And he was cautioned to return or circumvent. His choice was full steam ahead. And as a result of that, some 802 men died. 146 aircraft were lost. And yet, Kimmel back in Washington refused to punish him. There was also another uh, incident called the Gulf of Lenti. It was a moment in the war whenever the, the United States forces were seeking to land on an island off of this gulf. Halsey's job was to provide naval support for that invasion. The Japanese obviously read his uh, playbook. They knew his manner. And so what they did was they created some ships that were absolutely useless and empty. And they used them to tease Halsey's combative ability. And as they sailed away from this island, Halsey followed them, intent on destroying them. Of course, while that was happening, another Japanese force was coming in from the south. The invasion was ultimately successful but at an extraordinarily high cost. In fact, at one point, Halsey received this communication from Nimitz. The world wonders where you are. And yet, when it was finished, uh, Halsey is a guy who performed admirably. The successes at Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands and the Marshall Islands are very much a part of his legacy. He was a genius in military strategy, and he was tough when it came to battle. In fact, when the war ended, this is the communication that Admiral, by this time Rear Admiral Halsey sent to his fleet. Quote, cessation of hostilities. The war is over. If Japanese airplanes should appear, shoot them down, but in a friendly way. <laughs> uh, when the war was finished, uh, Halsey spent a couple of months representing our government in North and South America. He was a, he was a beloved hero. Uh, following that, he was officially retired from the Navy, but not really. For you see, he was granted the rank of Fleet Admiral, which is a level that remains for life. It's also important to note that he is only one of five naval leaders who have been given that honor. In retirement, he lived in New Jersey. He was on the board of ITT. He maintained an office in Washington, D.C. 
and he once tried to make his old ship, the Enterprise, into a museum in New York Harbor, but that failed. So let's return to that family, doing the correct thing, but not passionately. When he retired, he had not seen his wife for over 11 years. And because of that, he and his children had grown apart and estranged. During the latter years of his life, those relationships were somewhat mended. And he visited Fran as she was hospitalized in the city of Philadelphia. He was also known for his ability and interest in writing kind notes to old shipmates and their widows. In the tradition of Abraham Lincoln, he believed in the personal value of communication. He spoke out aggressively against autograph seekers. And he was not interested in being, as he once said, a cheerleader. Early in the 1950s, uh, he had often vacationed uh, off of Fisher Island, which is a lovely place just off of, uh, off of Long Island. And in 1959, he had been fighting a virus that malaise was back. The rash was horrific. And so along with a medical steward, uh, Admiral Halsey decided to go out to Fishing Island and spend some time. He arrived there on August the 1st, 1959. On August the 16th, at 11 o'clock in the morning, while alone in bed, he suffered a fatal heart attack. 100 miles from the birthplace he had known in New Jersey. Hughes writes that he died alone. He died alone. Of course, his body laid in state in D.C. He was only taken to the National Cathedral, where there was a military funeral. Chester Dimitz was one of the honorary pallbearers. There was a 21-gun salute. There was a flyover. And then he was very quietly interred in Arlington Cemetery beside his father and mother. And of course, Fran would follow him in 1968. I close with this statement before I make some observations. He once said these words, and I quote, there are not great men. There are only great challenges which ordinary men, out of necessity, are forced by circumstance to meet. We're living in an interesting time. I think we're living in a time when sometimes our heroes, our heroes, disappoint us. The story of William Halsey, I think, gives us some hope in that if we look closely enough, sooner or later, you're going to find a person who has the abilities, the insight, and the desire within the limits of human frailty to do the kinds of things that need to be done. Uh, following up uh, four years at Bethany College, I spent some years in the Marine Corps. And uh, in the Corps, there are a couple of uh, refrains. We leave nobody behind. Nobody. And number two, these words that were often spoken by drill sergeants. When the bleep hits the fan, so far with me? When the bleep hits the fan, some guys run, some guys stay. The guys that stay are truly your friends. Bill Halsey, I think, fits that category, complete with his rash, his insomnia, the sadnesses of his family, but it hit the fan. Bill Halsey, stay. That's the best I can do for you. But maybe we we'll have some questions or uh, inquiries. <coughs> yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you for being my standing in the presentation as a history buff. I was going to ask questions about things that you already covered. I want to make a personal comment. 
my older brother was on the USS Franklin when the Kamikaze hit it. And so for taking off that gun and destroy your escort Joseph E. Partly, which was torn apart, going into the typhoon, it was directed by Mr. by Admiral Halsey. So Halsey was famous for that. Interestingly, as you said, he's one of the five one of the five admirals of uh, uh, well, I can read the limits, etc. King, etc. But but uh, there's also strong pressure to have him put back instead of getting that fifth star and give it to uh, Admiral uh, Stewart instead. Admiral Stewart, as you know, at Halsey's suggestion, was at the head of the Federal Midway. Right. But uh, the uh, uh, thing is, because he was so popular in the papers, like uh, the general, who mentioned Patton, Patton uh, they knew that they could do that. He got the five stars. And that is why they could go to Raymond Stewart. Could you comment on Raymond Stewart? I could comment on, I think it's more critical for me to comment on the relationship that Halsey had with him, uh, which was an affectionate one. It was a respectful one. But they were very different in their styles. And I think at that point it's important to say that, right, wrong, or otherwise, and I'm not here to make a defense, what I'm here to say is that Halsey was a man who believed in the aggressive pursuit of the enemy. Um, and I think it was for that reason that the fifth star, which you so well said, was given to him, and I think it's remained. Uh, and I think you have to understand that, well, who cares what I think? But this is what I think. I think you have to understand that given the context of that time. The world was a very frightening place. There was a lot, there was a lot of hostility, a lot of, I mean, when you think about Pearl, and I'm sure your family thinks about that. The enormous loss of life and the indignity of that attack. When you think about uh, kind of Paris Island, anybody by chance? Paris Island? No? Uh, sorry. Not Paris Island. They have a wall. And on that wall, as best they know, there were the names of guys that died in those campaigns throughout the South Pacific. And we're not talking about a couple. So those kinds of times, I believe, require men like Lyndon Halsey. And in the doing of that, they're going to sail through typhoons because they have a, hey, who among us does not have a blind spot? And I think given his record and what he achieved, was the reason this <laughs> I think it has to do with the times in which he lived. So thank you for your and for the sacrifice of your family. Thank you. Others? Sir? Uh, you mentioned uh from the Kimmel from Berwick. And I believe he took a lot of he was discredited for not being prepared. And, um, and I was wondering if there was any other interaction you know of between him and all him and Halsey, like after that when uh, there, there was several theories of, of stuff being uh, information being with both of them. I just wondered if you ever get into that. In the book that I've read by Hughes, and incidentally I'd recommend to all of you to read it. It's a wonderful book. It's what was his name? Thomas Hughes. It's a Thomas Alexander Hughes. He's a military uh, historian, as I said. Uh, and he speaks to that very, very briefly. And, you, and, and the, simple, the simple statements that he makes is this. Not only Kimmel, but the entirety of our intel operation at that time missed an awful lot. Um, including Halsey. And that the relationship between Halsey and Kimmel, Kimmel was never broken apart by the breach, uh, I guess you could say, the breach of confidence that should have been operated. Because quite clearly, uh, Hughes only alludes to this. There were plenty of indicators that the Japanese were prepared to launch a major, major, major air-oriented attack. And as I said in the presentation, our intel, for some reason, focused on Wake. That's as far as he goes. Thank you. Please. Yes. Um, you did 
didn't mention the Battle of Midway, which I've always been fascinated with. Um, but that that was um, a victory from intelligence, wasn't it? I mean, we had broken the Japanese code, which allowed us to know that they were headed for Midway at the time. And um, another thing that always fascinated me was about the Enterprise uh, was that it was one of the carriers that was not at Pearl Harbor when it was bombed. And in fact, none of them were. But the reason for that was because of weather. They had such bad weather that it delayed them. And uh, what I read was um, that the sailors on board those ships uh, they were really looking forward to getting into Pearl Harbor for Saturday night because that's when all the action was on shore in, uh, at Pearl Harbor on Saturday night. And uh, they were so disappointed when they had to slow down because of the weather. And um, then, uh, but later on, they were so thankful for that after they heard about the bombing because none of the carriers were there. The Japanese didn't get our carriers bombed them. Well, so that that was one of the things that saved us, you know. Absolutely. In the and of course, that was part of all these command. Right. You know, they were ferrying those, those aircraft. Right. And uh, they, had, had he not had that assignment, and you're absolutely correct, had there not been inclement weather, he probably would have been involved in Pearl. Right. And, and Hughes only alludes, you know, Hughes does not pursue Midway aggressively. He pretty much acknowledges that in light of. Pearl and the irony that you pointed out of why those men were not there and thus lived. Others. There was a, the third and the fifth fleet it was the two big fleets. A uh, lot of people didn't know they were the exact same fleet. So right. depending upon who, who commanded them. Yeah. I, I was intrigued by. I was intrigued by how. Uh, how little we know about what happened in the South Pacific. And I think part of that is due to the fact that we were so focused on Europe, and rightly so, I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have been, but I'm saying that that seemed to have a higher level of, avail of visibility. And some of the experiences that occurred in the South Pacific were horrific. And as you say, many of the informations, uh, likewise, you know, my, uh, my only, my only childhood awareness of the South Pacific had to do with General Douglas MacArthur. And incidentally, in the book, Hughes talks about how it was that as the third fleet commander, Halsey was charged with dealing with MacArthur, and he found him to be a competent, solid general of a good spirit. And also in the book, Hughes talks about the fact that Halsey oftentimes was the mediator between men like MacArthur and Nimitz and others who found themselves uh, hopelessly locked in deadlock. But yes, please, sir. I assume you're aware or familiar with the Indianapolis disaster. That's the ship that delivered the atomic bomb that was sunk after the war was over. Totally disaster, all kind of lives lost. And the commander of that ship, I think everybody above him, all the way to Washington, D.C., threw him under the bus. He ultimately committed suicide. I don't think Halsey was in that chain of command. And if you've read the book about the Indianapolis, like I have, that the commander of that ship really got the shaft, in my opinion. Thrown under the bus by everybody, including Nimitz. If Halsey had been in the chain of command, do you think he would have thrown him under the bus too? I'm not good at speculations. <laughs> um, but my thinking based upon this book is that Halsey might have been sympathetic to that man's situation. And the only reason I say that is this. Well, two reasons. Number one, his track record in terms of dealing with people. But beyond that, Time, time to time, his acknowledgement of his own failures. I don't think Halsey ever presented himself as, he presented himself as being strong, and they called him Bull Halsey, and he was aggressive and he was tough. But I don't think he thought of himself as being omniscient. And therefore, based upon those two observations, I would think that probably, perhaps, 
he might have been more lenient. If you've ever been in the service, you know that it is not uncommon to throw people under the bus. The chain of command is, uh, in my opinion, everybody did, including Nimitz. Oh yeah, well Nimitz was- I was assuming this guy, I read the book a long time ago, I was assuming Halsey was in there too, which he's not. I don't think he is. He did not, Halsey was not above him. No, he was actually, hard. actually he and Nimitz were, I think, somewhat peers. In terms of how they were, how they were perceived. Oh, really? Yeah. How they were perceived. I thought Nimitz was high above Halsey, huh? So you think they, they were peers? I think they were peers. Oh, okay. Nimitz certainly did not yeah. exert any influence over him. There was a, there's a point in the book where Nimitz wanted to have Halsey recalled and sent back to the Navy Yard. Came all over road that. He stays. We need him there. One more now. I think we're done. What time do you get out of here? Three o'clock. <laughs> I don't. I just don't want to. Keep the yes. you know, my wife's uncle lived on the in Indianapolis when Nimitz was the captain of it, and in those days they used to have competition between the ships, and Nimitz was always number one, and, and the Indianapolis was number one. And when you go on those competitions, yeah, that's interesting. Well, yes, so yes. What happened to Margaret and Bill? Uh, they lived to be relatively normal lives. Uh, she died, I think, in the early 60s, and he in the early 70s. He did not pursue a career in the military, uh, and their relationship with her dad was restored. Uh, there was a sense of reconciliation uh, with them. I'm sure that they were not sure. Hughes leaves us with the notion that they were never close, right. but they were affectionate. <coughs> Oh, before, yes. yes. By the way, speaking of the Navy of the Pacific, Bridgeville's first World War II casualty was Alexander Rassi. He was on the Juno with the Sol. Is that right? Yep. Bridgeville's very first, first World War II. Yeah. Wow. Isn't it wonderful? We left to buy a block from here on Baldwin Street. Isn't it interesting whenever you begin to read about the history of world events? as they were either populated by, or influenced by, or had an impact upon people that we knew, if you will. You know, I go to uh, I go down to the wall in Washington, D.C. And uh, it's a pretty personal moment. I don't look at 50,000 names. I look at 10 names. Guys that I knew, and they're never coming home. So I think when you have an experience such as you just suggested, where a town, a community is aware of a loss and the high, high coming over here today, from each to them. Coming over here today, I pulled up behind the car and I noticed the uh, license plate. Gold Star family. You might think me silly for saying this, but you know, I could not wait until I got to the next red light. And I went into the turning lane, and even though I wasn't going to turn. Couldn't wait to get alongside that car in motion, roll the window down, and say thank you. We don't do enough of that in this culture. And we think about the enormous price that is paid by young men and women uh, in the enterprises of war. We think we gotta wake up a tad and realize that uh, those 10 guys I know aren't coming home. And their families have had to go on without them. And um, I think it was uh, Dwight Eisenhower. I could be wrong on that. I think it was Dwight Eisenhower who once said, war always has a face. It always has a face. It's not fought by robots. Here's another thing that sticks in my craw. Boots on the ground. Let's stop saying that stupid phrase. 
We're not talking about boots on the ground. We're talking about human beings on the ground and on the sea and in the air, subject to all the vulnerabilities of being in those locations. Not boots. They're people. You can replace boots in a minute. Not so much with boots. Anybody else? I better get off my Yes, please. I just wanted to tell you, I have some extra things here. Um, I'm from Crafton. I went to Crafton High School. Yeah. And I did research on Crafton High School people who were involved in World War II. Oh, wow. And I found out that um, one of them was a woman who was, um, she never told her families this, but during the war, she was worked for the code breakers in the Department of the Navy in Washington, D.C. And um, when she was dying of Lou Gehrig's disease many years later, uh, she said, now, there's something I never told you. She said, um, go over to that drawer up there, there's a little box in the top drawer, and bring it to me. And they did, and she took the lid off, and she said, these were my poison pills that I was given in case the Japanese or the Germans ever captured Washington, D.C., and we were told to take the pills. So you have that with you today? Uh, yes, I do. And um, then, then there's uh, another one an, um, of, a, of a sailor, uh, an officer who had gone to uh, Annapolis, and he graduated from Crafton High School also. And um, he was... Um, on the, he actually was on assigned to the West Virginia, and he was on shore leave when Pearl Harbor was bombed. So he wasn't in the West Virginia when it was destroyed. Uh, well, not totally, I guess they did rebuild it later. But uh, anyway, after that, he was assigned to the Enterprise, and he was at the Battle of Midway, and he was wounded on the flight deck. He had a, a hip wound, and he had to be hospitalized for a while from that. So I feel like I have two Good. connections to, from Absolutely. my high school that yeah. were in the war, you know. Thank so. you for that. Thank you. Before I go, I think we need to lighten this up just a little bit. And I'd like to tell you a story about a retired Methodist preacher. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> Not a priest. A retired Methodist preacher. But one day the preacher's wife uh, noticed that he would get very sluggish and very tired. He didn't want to do anything. She said, go to the doctor, find what's going on. So he went to the doctor and ran all these blood tests. And the doctor said, well, you're suffering from very rare blood disease. What do I do about that? Well, he said, you're going to have to start taking medicine. Now, unfortunately, medicine is very expensive. How much is it? He said, $1,000 a month. Wow. He said, is, he said, is there any kind of uh, alternative? Well, the doctor said, there is. He said, you can receive the very same medicinal benefit that you would from this $1,000 a month drug by taking a glass of sherry once a day. Well, the preacher said, I couldn't take a glass of sherry. I'm a Methodist preacher. What would people say? The doctor said, isn't there a time in the day when you could surreptitiously do that? Well, he said, yeah, I guess when I'm shaving in the morning. The doctor says, that's the time. And several months go by. Man picks up, doing things, going to the movies, vacationing. Wife is excited. And one day she's at the food store. She encounters the doctor. The doctor says, how's your husband doing? She says, I don't know, he's doing great. I don't know what you did for him, but he's really doing well. Well, he said, I'm glad to hear that. It's always good to have a patient do well. However, she said, I'm a little concerned. Why? She said, I think he's getting a little forgetful. He said, why would you say that? Well, she said, he shaves about seven times a day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.